Very good. So yeah, we are very happy to um, introduce you to Eric Kurland. Most of you know him already, especially if you were here the last year. He did a very nice presentation at the demo session, for example, uh, to level, together with Alicia. Um, so this year he will be again at the uh, demo session, and he will present or he will present some examples of what, what he's talking about his 3D uh, space uh, museum today. So um, he, is, uh, he has 10 years of experience in connecting public to the 3D community. So he's the director of the annual LA 3D uh, movie festival and is five years already the president of um, the LA 3D club. Um, so also he is working professionally in 3D stereoscopic uh, sets ups and especially he was involved, for example, in the Grammy nominated um, music video All in Not Lost. He was the lead stereographer in the Oscar nominated animated Maggie Simpsons in the longest um, daycare. And he was a lead for the Emmy nominated VR show The Simpsons Planet of the Couches for uh, the Google Spotlight stories. Um, yeah, so this is what finished. <laughs> okay, so we're looking very much forward to the talk now. And please, Eric, go ahead. Not yet. Not yet. There we go, there we go. Okay. Uh, and this is uh, uh, 3D from beginning to end, so you'll want to put your glasses on. You want me to lower the lights? Oh, uh, you don't need to lower the lights, that's okay. Okay, so 3D Space, the Center for Stereoscopic Photography, Art, Cinema, and Education, is a Los Angeles-based nonprofit dedicated to the preservation of the history of stereoscopic imaging and the advancement of current and future 3D arts and sciences. 3D Space has implemented an ongoing program of public presentations, classes, and workshops, and operates a museum gallery in Los Angeles. I founded 3D Space in 2014, and I currently serve as the CEO and Executive Director. And in this talk, I want to give you some history on the museum's origins, where we are right now, and some of our goals for the future. Oh, I need the uh, clicker. You need the controller? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I do a lot of public outreach and stereoscopic presentations. And I always start by asking my audiences, how many of you have looked at 3D images at home? Okay, so this crowd is sort of the exception to the rule, uh, but usually I only see one or two hands. Uh, let's, do, let's do that again. Get that server. Sure, sure. Okay, how many of you have looked at 3D at home? Okay, so I usually only see one or two hands, and at that point, I pull out a Viewmaster, and I ask, how many of you ever had one of these? And then I just see everyone's hand go up. Uh, and I, I see smiles on everyone's faces, and I, I know that everybody loves Viewmasters, right? So I say, you're all thinking too narrowly about 3D. You loved 3D when you had your Viewmaster. And I explained to them that uh, the Viewmaster was actually first introduced at the 1939 World's Fair in New York. And while the shape of the viewer has evolved through the years, the form factor of the reels themselves has stayed exactly the same. So we currently have uh, 80 years of stereoscopic reels, and you can go down to the store and buy a current Viewmaster and look at any of those 80 years worth of 3D images. Now I also explained that uh, this is the 20th century version of a stereoscope and that there's a hundred years. I'm gonna turn it down, but I think that might be better. Yeah, let's turn it down. Okay. There's a hundred years of 3D before this, dating back to Wheatstone's first stereoscope in 1838. And the past truly informs the future, as our 21st century virtual reality headsets are direct descendants of Victorian optical technology. I tell them how popular stereographs were during the latter half of the 19th century, that the stereoscope was the home entertainment system of the period, and that stereo views were produced on just about every subject imaginable. And just like modern VR, it was allowing people to travel to far off places and experience events in immersive three dimensions. 
And then I show them a three-dimensional picture of Abraham Lincoln taken in 1865, and their minds are blown. They're hooked, and at that point, they want to learn more. But what I find when I talk to people who are outside of the 3D community is that most people tend to take their own stereo vision for granted. They have little idea of how 3D images work or are made, and they tend to think of 3D as just this movie gimmick with a brief history that goes back as far as Avatar or maybe Jaws 3D. So clearly, there is a gap in the public education about stereoscopy. Now, the Viewmaster was, in fact, my own introduction to 3D and how we see in stereo. Uh, this one actually is my childhood Viewmaster that I got when I was about five or six years old. Now, I'm very nearsighted, and I've worn corrective glasses since preschool. Uh, my right eye is dominant, so when I first got my Viewmaster, I would always close my left eye when I looked in, and I'd only look in with my stronger right eye. And then one time when I was about seven, I was looking at a reel, and I remember exactly which one. It was actually this image of Popeye and olive oil with uh, little hearts floating over their heads. And for some reason, I opened my left eye, and it literally popped into 3D. Uh, there's even some intentional retinal rivalry in the red and white hearts that makes them kind of shimmer. Uh, Ray Zone would have loved that. And I had this epiphany. I, I, thought, do all Viewmasters do this? And I ran around the house to find every reel I could get my hands on and see the revelatory 3D images. And this started a lifelong passion for 3D for me, all forms of stereoscopic images, from anaglyphic illustrations, lenticular postcards, uh, polarized movies, laser illuminated holograms, anything 3D. But there weren't many resources to learn about 3D, and it wasn't until nearly 25 years later that I actually started making my own stereo images and began working professionally as a 3D consultant and stereographer. Now, I mentioned the 3D community. In 2002, I joined the LA 3D Club, which was actually founded in 1955 by a group of amateur 3D photographers as the Stereo Club of Southern California. It's one of many organized stereo enthusiast groups around the country and the world. And there I met uh, other people who were also passionate about 3D and very happy to share their knowledge. I became involved in curating 3D content through the club, preserving 3D history, and doing public outreach and education. And this is also where I first met Ray Zone. Now, many of you knew Ray. Uh, he often attended this conference. Ray made a living converting flat art into 3D for comic books. But he was also a filmmaker, a lecturer, and a 3D historian, having written a number of books on that subject. Ray kind of took me under his wing, and he mentored me in everything three-dimensional. We first had the idea of opening a 3D museum together uh, back in 2012, when Ray and I were able to rescue three truckloads of artifacts from the estate of the late 3D expert Dan Sims. Uh, we were able to do this thanks to an angel benefactor who actually backed the purchase of the items uh, on the condition that we end up doing something positive with it. So Ray and I discussed the possibility of someday finding a place to publicly display these materials. And sadly, Ray passed away before we were able to move forward with any plans together. But the idea continued to grow. And in 2013, at the World 3D Expo 3 in Hollywood, uh, a piece from that collection was put on display. Uh, it was the natural vision camera rig used to film House of Wax in 1953. And it is a beast. It's massive, it weighs about 400 pounds. So I became the sole caretaker of this large collection, and I decided that starting a nonprofit would be the, the best route to move forward. So I assembled a board of directors, and I sought out advisors from different disciplines, academia, museums and art galleries, successful nonprofit arts groups, uh, the entertainment industry, and the international 3D community. And uh, I gave myself kind of a crash course in how to start a nonprofit. I ran a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo, uh, both to raise startup capital and to gauge the interest in there actually being a dedicated 3D museum. And uh, fortunately, several hundred supporters collectively contributed about $14,000 in startup funding. So 3D Space was incorporated in the state of California in November of 2014, uh, and we applied for tax-exempt status. Now, at that time, uh, we were able to benefit from a brand new program that had been implemented by the government to simplify nonprofit registration for small organizations. 
The regular process often takes up to two years just to get approved. But thanks to this new program, we actually were granted 501c3 nonprofit status in March of 2015, barely five months after applying. Our collection began to grow, and uh, uh, we ended up uh, the Portland, Oregon-based Center for Art and uh, 3D Center for Art and Photography, uh, which had operated for eight years in Portland, uh, unfortunately had to close its doors in 2012. But they officially transferred their entire collection down to 3D space in Los Angeles. And we also started receiving donations from private collectors and estates, and we acquired a, a good portion of Ray Zone's personal 3D collection from his family. And now for the first three years after its formation, we maintained a workshop and storage facility uh, for the collections, but we had no public space. 3D Space operated a museum without a permanent home, presenting movie screenings, educational workshops, and outreach events uh, in collaboration with other museums, organizations, and nonprofits at their locations. And our, our programs uh, through those three years have included a long-term partnership with the Downtown Independent Theater in Los Angeles, where we present monthly 3D movie screenings, including talks with filmmakers and a quarterly open screen where anyone's invited to bring their own stereoscopic content. Uh, 3D Space also produces the annual LA 3D Movie Festival, which is held at the theater every December. And for several years, we provided content from the festival to the 3D theater here at the conference. We've done numerous 3D movie screenings, setting up and operating temporary 3D theaters at locations all over California. And these are just a few of our screening partners. We've also been working with the estate of silent film star and prolific stereo photographer Harold Lloyd. Uh, we've been assisting them in digitizing and the presentation of images from uh, Harold Lloyd's photography archive of over 250,000 3D slides. And we've collaborated with the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Hollywood Heritage Museum, and Walt Disney Animation to publicly show Harold's work. We've also done traveling museum exhibits and educational presentations for a number of venues. And we've consulted with the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for their current large-scale stereoscopic exhibit, 3D Double Vision, uh, which is running through March. If you find yourself in Los Angeles, you should definitely check it out. We've collaborated with the London Stereoscopic Company, which is owned by one of our advisors, astrophysicist, stereo collector, and historian, and queen guitarist, Dr. Brian May. 3D Space has provided technical support and projection for Dr. May's public presentations of his various 3D historical books. And something I'm very proud of is our 2016 effort to restore a lost 1963D film, a feature film called September Storm. Through a Kickstarter campaign, we were able to raise $34,000 to fund the digitization and restoration of this historic film, which was the first motion picture to be released, uh, first 3D motion picture to be released in Cinemascope and the first to have color stereoscopic underwater cinematography. Thanks to our backers, the 3D Film Archive was able to complete the preservation work, and the movie is available now on 3D Blu-ray from Kino Classics. Now, at the beginning of 2018, we were actually offered the opportunity to lease a brand new basement space that had just been excavated in the same building where we already store our collection. The new area was small, but it had potential to work as an exhibit gallery. So finally, in the summer of 2018, we opened the doors on our starter museum, 3D Space version 1.0, in the Echo Park neighborhood of Los Angeles. Uh, we've affectionately nicknamed it the 3D Bunker, and our new center is a public space for stereoscopic art, science, and history. We're utilizing the gallery to rotate between exhibiting pieces from our museum collection, displaying contemporary works by 3D image makers, and holding classes and presentations. Our first exhibit opened July 1st, 2018, 3D Spaces, an Eclectic Collection of Stereoscopic Artifacts. Uh, it was a curated selection of coin-operated stereo viewers, antique handheld stereoscopes, vintage 3D glasses, 3D comic book and movie memorabilia, and a display of 20th century stereo cameras. The second exhibit opened October 16th, 2018. Uh, it was called 3D Monsters, and it was a display of horror-related 3D movie memorabilia. 3D comic books, Victorian diableries, stereoscopic slides, lenticular prints, and more Halloween-themed material. Uh, last fall, we also held our first class for students. Uh, it was an intro to stereo photography class. Our third exhibit 
no glass is required, is a show of lenticulars, holograms, and autostereoscopic displays. Uh, it's opening soon. In fact, uh, as soon as I get back to Los Angeles, I have to get things ready to open the doors on that. And some of our planned exhibits through 2019 and 2020 uh, include uh, look at Viewmasters, uh, uh, various photography shows, comic books, uh, and a number of other 3D subjects that should uh, carry us uh, through quite a ways. Now, our long-term goals for the museum include seeking corporate and government grants to enable us to actually digitize the vast archive of stereo cards, slides, and photographs that we have and make them available in a virtual online version of the museum. Uh, we also want to create 3D education curriculums for schools, camps, and STEM and STEAM programs. And ultimately, we want to raise the funds to not only make 3D space fully sustainable, but to also allow us to expand our footprint. We ultimately want to have our own building that will include the museum, as well as a proper 3D theater, a classroom, and research archive. We want 3D space to be a hub for 3D, where the public, stereo enthusiasts, and 3D professionals can all learn and interact with one another. So in closing, I should note that being a 501c3 nonprofit, we rely entirely on the generosity of our donors to keep the center going. We're using the Patreon online platform to build a membership of sustaining patrons, and we've cultivated an internet presence on social media. We've also produced a series of informative YouTube videos on various stereoscopic subjects. You can visit our website, join our email list, and connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to learn more about the latest news and programming and the various ways that you can support 3D Space's efforts. Uh, I, as they mentioned, I'm going to have a mini exhibit from the collection uh, in this evening's demonstration session, and uh, uh, it'll be hands-on. Uh, I encourage you to come out and check out some of the things that I've brought. And I'd just like to end now with one of the short YouTube videos that was produced during that campaign to save September Storm. Hi. I'm Eric Curlin from 3D Space, and this is the Natural Vision 3D camera rig from the 1950s that was used to film the above water scenes in September Storm. It was developed by Hollywood screenwriter Milton Gunsberg and his ophthalmologist brother Julian, and built by camera engineer Friend Baker and camera technician Lothrop Worth. This system utilized a pair of Mitchell NC 35mm cameras one to shoot the left eye view, and one to shoot the right eye view. Now, in order to shoot 3D, the lenses from both cameras need to be placed close together, like our eyes. But these cameras were too big to place side by side. So instead, the cameras were pointed at each other lens to lens, and they filmed the reflection off of two front surface mirrors positioned at 45 degree angles to the lenses. The inward angles of the mirrors could be slightly adjusted to change the point where the stereoscopic images converge, similar to the way that our eyes converge on a subject that we're looking at. For this reason, the Gunsberg named their system Natural Vision. Now, this large green housing is called a blimp, and it was used to minimize the noise produced by the two very loud camera motors, which, by the way, had to run together in perfect synchronization. The rig itself is built on a steel lathe bed inside the blimp, and when the two cameras with full film magazines were mounted on this, it was incredibly heavy and had to be moved around on set with a crane or a forklift. It also required multiple operators, one for the camera on that side and one for the camera on this side, and another one in the back looking through a viewfinder between the lenses to frame the shot. The first natural vision system was used to shoot Arch Obler's 1952 independent feature Buona Devil. That rig was actually damaged toward the end of production, and five additional rigs were constructed in February of 1953 when Warner Brothers hired the Natural Vision Company to film their first 3D picture, House of Wax, starring Vincent Price. Natural Vision was also used for the 3D movies Fort Tye, Charge at Feather River, The Moonlighter, Devil's Canyon, Top Banana, Adam and Six Eves, Gog, which, by the way, was also amazingly restored by the 3D Film Archive, The Mouseketeers 3D Jamboree for Disneyland, and, of course, September Storm. At least, the above-water scenes in September Storm. We're not entirely sure about what camera system was used for the underwater sequences, but we are researching that now to find out. Now, as far as we know, this rig is the only natural vision from the 1950s to survive. 
and we have it in our museum collection at 3D Space, the Center for Stereoscopic Photography, Art, Cinema, and Education. You can learn more about our ongoing efforts to open a 3D museum here in Los Angeles by visiting 3-dspace.org. Now, one interesting thing to note is that natural vision isn't mentioned anywhere in the promotional materials for September Storm. Because by the time it was being filmed in 1959, the Natural Vision Company had sold off their rigs to a camera equipment rental company in Hollywood. In fact, September Storm wasn't even marketed using the term 3D, since the 3D fad had pretty much died out in 1954, losing to the more economical cinemascope anamorphic widescreen process. 3D was frowned upon in 1960, so the film's marketing instead tried to make it sound like a new technology by touting the miracle of stereo vision for the first time the new dimension that combines all dimensions. And instead of 3D glasses, all of the advertising declared that you will see it with special viewers designed by master craftsmen. Hope that gives you a little bit of background as to uh, how 3D space started and uh, where we hope to go with it. Um, thank you very much for your time.